because the jazz has been calling for its, there's been a call for its death since it was born. <laughs> I was inspired once I was going through microfilm magazines and Lincoln Center Library went back to 30s and 40s and I would see periodically articles about is jazz dying? Through this video, I'm going to walk through some major questions surrounding the way we think about music. If that sounds confusing, good. I will hopefully clarify some of your questions and leave many unanswered, leading you to think about things further. I will attempt to hopefully spark some inquiry in you viewers into listening, thinking about, and performing jazz or improvised music. There is a long musicological slash philosophical history of inquiry into how we think about and conceptualize music. Though, as I have spent time reading, I have found that the majority of the time, these concepts are based on the Western art music tradition. Though there is a small body of knowledge that does address some of the specific issues in regards to jazz music. Through this video, I will describe how these aesthetic conceptions can be applied to improvised music, hopefully leading to somewhat of a deeper understanding to the value and end concepts of jazz. Why look at or think about jazz through a more philosophical lens? Both of these areas have reputations for being both esoteric or academic. I hope to break down these boundaries to show you that both of these areas are deeply linked together, as well as having a deep, rooted, emotional, or poetic effect that sometimes are lost in a more general audience. Who am I, and why am I qualified to talk to you about this? Well, truthfully, I am not fully qualified, but I think I have accumulated a lot of interesting information. Uh, you can think of me as a video format essay summarizer, if you will. My name is Josh Crucial. I have recently completed my undergraduate degree at McEwen University. I play jazz piano. And during my time at McEwen, I had the opportunity to take a number of musicology courses. This sparked my love of philosophy and reading, so I figured, why not combine the two here? Unfortunately, I would have to cover the entire history of the philosophy of music, as well as uh, the entirety of jazz history, to give you everything in the correct amount of context. So there will be some things in here that are slightly more surface level than I would like. But uh, that's just how I will keep this video from being two hours of me ranting and raving, which could happen easily. I believe that a good place to start if we are trying to conceptualize jazz music in our current world would be the concept of the three spheres of music that I stumbled upon while viewing one of my favorite music YouTubers, Sideways. He makes absolutely amazing content on film music, musical theater and storytelling, as well as music theory. You should definitely go check him out if you have a chance. This is simply just a model that some musicologists use to generally categorize music. The three spheres are pop, folk, and art music. Let's start with folk music. Folk music is described as music that is only performed at certain functions or for certain specific reasons that are passed down orally, typically with somewhat unknown authorship, and are valued by a specific population. We often look far from home when uh, discussing pop music, but in reality, we don't have to. Whenever we sing happy birthday or remove our hats to hockey game, we are participating in a folk music tradition. Next, let's turn to pop music. Pop music is just that. Its primary function is to be appealed to by the masses, written and understood by as many people as possible. An example of this, just turn on the radio, um, and it's often governed by money. This is not to say that popular music is in any way less important or legitimate. It is simply governed by a different metric than our first example. Uh, the next time that someone tells you that pop music is garbage because it's so predictable or whatnot, tell them to prove it, because it's extremely difficult to predict what becomes popular and what's going to make the most money. Art music is music that is written and performed to convey an idea or concept. Whether this is a concrete programmatic idea like we may see in Peter and the Wolf, where different instruments represent different storylines or uh, characters, or it could also be a musical concept, such as something like serialism, where the musical concept is using all 12 notes of the equal tempered scale in specific ways, with specific rules. This comes to where we can finally talk about jazz. Jazz is a wonderful example of a music that has worked its way through all three of these spheres. Jazz evolved from blues that began as the work songs of slaves, a folk music, 
then became a popular music starting in the 1920s, as soon as the radio came into play, and in the last 50 years or so has been regulated to the concert halls and academia. Now this, again, isn't to make some sort of completed judgment about why jazz is what it is, but simply to help situate it within our current discussion. What is jazz? We have just seen how jazz fits into one conception, but is this good enough? Does this description of a practice of music that has gone through all three spheres suffice as a definition? I'm not convinced that it is so. I would like to turn to some of the thoughts premiered by a fantastic jazz trumpeter Nicholas Payton to help us situate it better. In late 2011, trumpet player Nicholas Payton became the latest in a long line of public figures to declare jazz to be dead. As he announced the death of jazz, Peyton attributed it to a white-controlled music industry that has not allowed black expression on its own terms. In particular, Peyton considered the word jazz itself to be a tainted label forced on musicians to separate them from the popular music. As an alternative, Peyton suggested his own term for the music that he plays, black American music, a term rejected by some white musicians and critics because it was seen as racially exclusionary. Peyton premiered this discussion on a blog post titled On Why Jazz Isn't Cool Anymore. I again urge you to go check this out as Peyton's poem-like post is extremely eye-opening. So, why isn't jazz cool anymore, according to Peyton? Quote, The very fact that so many people are holding on to this idea of what jazz is supposed to be is exactly what makes it not cool. For Peyton, the issue is the compartmentalization of black artistry through genre-specific labels such as jazz. Jazz died because it had been cut off from the other non-jazz forms of black musical creativity, particularly rock, R&B, soul, and hip-hop. By relabeling his music as black American music, Peyton attempts to bring it closer to the black popular music forms which had been artificially separated from jazz through racist genre definitions in the music industry. This discourse, started by Peyton in the early 2010s, has now been brought into the mainstream jazz community, with many artists standing in support and reclamating their music as black American music. The confusion as to what qualifies as jazz is at the center of creation and invigoration of this art form, as at its very core, this music is creative, abstract, and a personal activity. Quote, where jazz went wrong to me is when it became a thing of always having to be a walking 4-4 on the bass and spang-a-lang on the ride cymbal. That idea didn't even exist when Louis Armstrong's hot vibes were recorded. The early cats were much more open than the latter generations were about what jazz should be. Jazz became too much of a thing, an idea. Who killed jazz? Jazz killed itself. And the only thing that will resurrect it is cats swinging soulfully in all manner of expression available in the arsenal of information we have at our disposal. This is not to say that Peyton is claiming that the practice of black American music is to exclude other groups of people. He is actually saying kind of the opposite. Firstly, I think that we should acknowledge its origin, black. But it's more than that. Secondly, it's American. Though it is a black invention, without whites, Latinos, indigenous peoples, or any other of the cultures that make America what it is, it would not be possible. And of course, lastly, it's music. Bam. Black American music. The academization of jazz is another interesting problem, as it takes this black American music and sacralizes it. Lawrence Levine has written on the sacralization within classical music. For Levine, sacralization entails strategies of elevating music to the realm of high art, while separating it from the lower classes. We are seeing this directly within the ecosystem of the institutional jazz education. This sacralization of jazz leads it to being discussed in the language of high art, which allows it to receive funding from upper regiments of society. However, this leads to jazz becoming inaccessible to black communities because of education discrimination and broader socioeconomic inequality. This is a direct issue that needs to be addressed, as this is literally ripping the music out of the hands of those who created it. On the other hand, this academization helps foster the legitimacy of jazz that can garner respect in the marketplace and the institutional support necessary to sustain music that takes creative risks. As I am not an expert on this situation, and I am also someone who have benefited from the system, I will not attempt to provide any direct solutions, but I can say that institutional support is absolutely vitally required to ensure equitable access to arts education. As I have just finished my time in the Jazz Academy, I decided that I would take some of these issues to a few of my fellow peers who have also been thinking about these things throughout our degrees. Art Taylor, 
the drummer, maybe mid 60s. He interviewed a lot of the people he had played with, like all big names in jazz. And um, he asked them, you know, just questions, general questions about their careers, you know, specific to them that he wanted to know. And then he asked them some questions. He asked each individual person the same question. One of the questions was, what does the word jazz mean to you? And the other one was, we know it. Jazz is an art form as we know it mean to you. And their answer to the jazz as a word is that jazz as a word has nothing to do with what was going on um, at the beginning of, you know, the swing era and um, the bebop era. It, it, that was to some of them what they called Afro-American music, right? Because they thought of it as their folk music. Once you hear that and then you look at yourself and you look at your community of white Canadian jazz musicians in a institute a brand new institution learning from white canadian jazz musicians and you go oh that's a little weird no i think the connection was it just feels distasteful a little bit right what and does the fact that it was a african-american folk music and we can think ourselves as maybe part of the death of it jazz music especially in the way nicholas payton's talking about it is a black american <clears throat> music that is a folk music that that the the origins of and the cultural context of and social context of needs to be understood and respected at least at least to the extent that people who call themselves experts on it need to understand i'm not saying right. everybody who interacts with it or enjoys the music needs to be fully part of everything but i think that the people who call themselves experts no matter what need to be aware pretty yeah. deeply of those things. Mm -hmm. Why should I care about music? Have you ever asked this question? Maybe you're a begrudged music fan who is wondering if there's anything within the musical sphere to care about, or you are a musician who is committed to your craft, having a particularly unmotivated day, or you are calling everything into question. This is an inherently existential question, as it is a question of meaning as well as the questions of suffering, hope, time, death, belonging, and coherence. These are individual existential situations that shake us from our usual patterns and cause us to know our own subjectivities from an unfamiliar angle. But what do these existential questions have to do about music? The following information comes from a paper by Pew and Varkoy and contains some ideas that I think are very interesting. I have provided a link in my extra materials as well. Musical experience seems to be particularly well suited to bringing us into contact with the basic conditions of our lives, such as dependency, vulnerability, morality, the fragility of relationships, and existential loneliness. In other words, music brings us into our own acknowledgement of our lack of control. These are the frames of human existence, and this is being opened to us by the artwork. When we feel shivers down our backs, when our hair stands on end, when we go alternatively hot and cold, when our pulse races, when our moods change, then music has brought us into contact with one or several of the basic conditions being mentioned previously, dependency, vulnerability, morality, or whatever else. The moment we are wrenched away from what is usual, controlled and controllable, chosen and planned, we become aware of our own vulnerability and smallness in the world and therefore our general dependency on vulnerability and mortality, our loneliness and the fragility of our relationships. We are reminded of our own existential situation as humans and are thrown into a sort of forgotten depth of the world, of being. Music has this effect on our humanity and that alone, I believe, is an effect that we can say is worth caring about. In conclusion, hopefully I have given you something to think about, for that was really my only goal. Thank you sincerely for coming along this journey of musical thinking with me. Please do not hesitate to reach out if you would like to talk to me about any of this further, as although I am nowhere near an expert, I do love to talk. Thank you very much.